You know, last time I was out here on the territory of our good friends in the Enoch Cree Nation, I was joined by Chief Moran, uh, their council, and working people from this community for an Indigenous land blessing of a major Trans Mountain construction yard located here. And while some people might be tempted to talk about construction ceremonies like that as the good old days, let me be very clear, I am not one of those people. Because as we talk about Trans Mountain here today and the politics of pipelines, it's those working people from right here in the Enoch Cree Nation that I'm thinking about. Hard-working people from a vibrant community. And it's true, people have had to put their tools down. But I am fighting as hard as I can to make sure they can pick them back up very, very soon. But before I talk a little bit about that fight, I want to say, first of all, that it's, it's really quite wonderful to be here today among some of Alberta's most dedicated public servants. Alberta's teachers and Alberta's public schools are a treasure. For generations, uh, including as far back as my grandmother, who used to teach in a, in a one-room schoolhouse just side, outside of Olds, you and all those others who came before you have helped to prepare our children for the challenges of a fast-changing world. Your commitment to public education powerfully expresses our province's commitment to opportunity, to equality, and to citizenship. Indeed, the state of public education is a good barometer of the health of any society. In those places where public schools are underfunded and ignored, you can bet that inequality is on the rise and opportunity is denied to those who weren't born wealthy. And where public schools are strong and where teachers are supported, it's also a good bet that opportunity is widely shared, the middle class is strong, and the economy works not for the few but for the many. Now, I'm a product of Alberta's public education system from grade one right through to my BA. So too are my children. So on behalf of my family and on behalf of all Albertans, I want to thank you for everything that you do. Now, I have come before you today to speak about Alberta's energy industry and about pipelines. And it's a very, very important topic, one that has generated a national conversation that, that affects every Albertan and, quite frankly, every Canadian. As public educators, you teach young people about these conversations and about our shared world. In so doing, you are teaching them to think critically and to make their voices heard. One of the greatest hopes for our future is young minds open to learning and willing to speak up. That's important because we need to make sure that every voice is heard, especially those of working people. So in addition to making the case for a new pipeline to the coast, I'm also here today to make a larger point that the pipeline debate brings to the surface, a point about the need for our politics to reflect the aspirations and needs of working people and those whose voices can sometimes get drowned out by the powerful. So I'm going to come at this conversation in a few ways. Now, you've all just heard from uh, Ms. Sapporo Berman, uh, and we're going to talk about her approach. And we're going to talk about our approach. And we're going to talk about fighting climate change and about why it's more important than ever that we get this pipeline built. And this conversation is more important than ever. I believe that at its best, government helps propel progress towards a more humane, a more prosperous, and a more equal society, one where working women and men participate fully in our economic and in our democratic life. But today, that idea is under assault. Around the world, it's under assault by politicians who, on the right who seek political profit from division and growing inequality, and quite frankly, by, by some on the left who have gradually lost touch with the vast majority of people whose support they need to make meaningful, progressive change, change that lasts. We're seeing this dynamic play out again and again most dramatically and worryingly in the United States. So as I've said, this morning you did hear from uh, Sabora Berman, and she's passionate, and she's very articulate. And of course, I will always defend her right to speak in any form, in any province, in any place. 
Indeed, soon after I was elected Premier, she worked with leaders in our energy industry to help fashion Alberta's response to climate change. Now, I get some blowback for this. Quite frankly, I know she does as well, mostly from an opposition leader who thought it wise to appoint Mike Duffy to the Senate. But uh, that's another story. <laughs> At the end of the day, I believe, and I, I still believe to this day, that considering the problem from all angles and bringing together people from all walks of life, academia, indigenous communities, industry, and more, is the best way to find solutions to common problems. And the best solutions will be found by looking at all the evidence and considering all sides, not just the sides that are convenient or that you like. I think that, that you folks as social studies teachers understand this better than most. So let me start then with what Ms. Berman and I agree on. Climate change is caused by humans. The science is settled. Climate change threatens our kids, our grandkids, our cities and towns. It is a huge problem. Half of our problem exists in the boreal forest, prone to fires. We also face flooding, blizzards and tornadoes. Our kids and grandkids will rightly blame us if we run from this problem because they won't have the luxury to run from it in the future. To tackle climate change, we have to take meaningful steps to reduce emissions. As Canada's largest carbon emitter, Alberta has a unique responsibility in this regard. It's a responsibility that I accept and I believe that, that most Albertans accept. Now, of course, not everybody, however, in Alberta accepts this. Some believe climate change is a hoax cooked up by nefarious forces pulling the strings in some crazy worldwide conspiracy. I know because many of these people glare across at me in the, across the aisle in the legislature. But again, different story, another time. But here's the issue. To reduce emissions, and this is where we disagree, Ms. Berman and others who are opposed to our pipelines argue that we must wind down oil sands production as quickly as possible. And we must stop Albertans from getting fair value for our resources on world markets by building new pipelines. In essence, they say we must sacrifice the jobs and well-beings of hundreds of thousands of working families. Now, of course, they don't put it exactly like that, but that is the implication, and quite frankly, that is the outcome. How people who work in the energy industry are supposed to put food on the table isn't a question that gets talked about. Apparently, what's most important now is that workers in our ener energy industry find something else to do and find it really quickly. And what that work actually looks like is anyone's guess. Some people were just born on the right side of history. Other people, like the oil sands worker to the gas station attendant who makes minimum wage, were born on the wrong side of history. Tough break. So this is where my opponents and I part ways. And I submit, submit that the approach of, of uh, uh, anti-pipeline activists is a disaster not only for working people, but quite frankly, for effective climate action as well. Because if we write off the jobs and the livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of working women and men, I guarantee you, we will write off the ability to move forward on climate or quite frankly, on just about any other progressive change. After all, the reality is this, the question I ask is this, who benefits when working women and men are treated as history's losers? Well, I will say to you that it is generally not the people who are fighting for the public good. As we see around the world, reality TV stars, climate change conspiracy theorists, and right-wing demagogues are the ones who flourish when working people are kicked to the curb. As premier, leading a government committed to advancing the economic interests of working people and helping the most vulnerable among us, I am not about to let that happen on my watch. Frankly, I think that's probably the job of the UCP, but then again, that's another story. Just the other day, one of their party's MLAs promised Albertans that if they are elected, and I quote, it's going to hurt. Interesting. I personally did not go into politics to hurt people. I went into politics on the conviction, nurtured by my family and a lifetime working for working people, that government can be a force for good when it helps people, not hurts them. So then rather than responding to the collapse in oil prices by firing a bunch of you folks and slashing funds for classrooms. We defended your jobs. 
We defended many others, and we put people to work building Alberta for the future. We reversed the old government's planned education cuts, and we increased the funding for education. 240 schools are being built or modernized. A new hospital in South Edmonton is underway. A new cancer center in Calgary is too. Better highways and bridges. Petrochemical plants and wind farms all under construction. All creating jobs. All fueling our economic recovery. We resisted calls to give the super wealthy a big tax cut, something my opponent in the next election is eager to do. And we established North America's most forward-looking climate plan, one that does something that too many climate plans have failed to do. It puts working people first, not last. Because while many anti-pipeline activists have the luxury of flying in and out of Alberta, spreading the verbal equivalent of pink slips after pink slip for working people, we know that nothing gets done without the people who produce the energy that powers those flights. The consent of the governed, an idea social studies teachers know well, it is the basis of our democracy. And it is a responsibility I take seriously. It's the democratic in the new Democratic Party. And it is why we consulted widely, we listened carefully, and we developed a plan that works for people. A plan that reduces emissions, supports jobs, and positions our economy for this century. Key to that plan is building a pipeline to the coast so Albertans can get fair value for every barrel we sell and invest that money in a more diversified and secure future. So we're going to talk about that plan in detail, our climate plan. But let me begin with this very fundamental thing that needs to be kept in mind. Building a new pipeline to the West Coast will not, I repeat, it will not increase emissions from our oil sands. A new pipeline will simply increase the return we all get for the resources we, as Albertans, all own. This is thanks to our climate leadership plan. So let me talk about that plan, how it works and how it accomplishes this. After years of inaction by a previous government that chose to hide its head in the sand and yell at its critics, Alberta needed to take action. Not to make the critics go away, but to make sure that Alberta stays an energy leader in a fast-changing global economy. Because we all know the world is moving to a lower carbon future. Yes, it's true that the Trump administration is undoing progress on climate action, but that's no reason to follow suit. Tomorrow's leaders will be those countries, those states, and in Canada, those provinces that anticipate and adapt to the change that is coming. Now, some people dismiss the progress we've made. I'll let you be the judge. First, Alberta's climate plan significantly reduces harmful methane emissions by 45%. It also phases out coal pollution. Right now, Alberta produces more coal pollution than all other provinces in this country combined. That affects our health and it contributes to climate change. Under our climate leadership plan, all coal-fired coal electricity generation and the harmful pollution that goes along with it is gone by 2030, at which time 30% of electricity will come from renewable sources. And while we're doing that, we're doing it by having the backs of those workers affected by the phase out with fu critical financial assistance, job training, bridging to retirement, and support for relocation. We've also capped oil sands emissions, capped them by law. So new pipelines don't mean more greenhouse gases, a fact that sometimes gets lost in the debate. Our climate plan also as you know, and as our opponents never tire of talking about, includes an economy-wide price on carbon. You know, the emissions reduction model that just won the Nobel Prize for economics. What those same opponents don't like to talk about is what the price on carbon supports. I am not so shy. The carbon levy funds Calgary's new Green Line, the largest infrastructure investment in Alberta's history helping 60,000 Calgarians get around town faster and more affordably. The carbon levy funds the expansion of Edmonton's LRT. It's helping Indigenous communities invest in renewable energy. Through Energy Efficiency Alberta, an organization that didn't exist three years ago, 
We are helping families save $300 million a year on heating and electricity bills. It also allowed us to reduce the small business tax by a third. It supports innovation in our oil sands with new money for research and development to reduce emissions. It has also helped us trigger game-changing investments in renewable energy. Investments that former governments always had the potential to tap into, but simply chose not to. Well, that choice held Alberta back. But today, with our plan, we are one of the hottest renewable energy markets on the continent. The carbon levy also comes with a rebate to low- and middle-income households. And make no mistake, without Alberta at the table, there is absolutely no way Canada meets its international climate commitments. None. So in summary, our plan, our plan that Albertans help build, it creates jobs and supports workers. It invests in cities and towns, in affordability for families, in cleaner, healthier air, and in a responsible, secure future for our kids. No government has gone further, not even close, and we're not backing down. But here's the bottom line. Climate action is not free. There is a cost. And to cover that cost, we must grow our economy. We must diversify our economy. We must create jobs. We must fund the things working people depend on. And that's why we need to build Trans Mountain. You see, right now, Alberta's oil will move to markets one way or another, as long as there is a demand. And according to the International Energy Agency, demand for oil is projected to increase over the next two decades, at least. The oil will move by train, or it will move by truck, or it will move by pipeline. Between these three options, there are some big differences. First, modern, well-regulated, well-designed, and closely supervised pipelines are the safest way to transport our resources, transporting them in a way that also generates fewer emissions than trucks and trains. Second, Diversifying the markets we sell to means we can eventually command a better price, getting each and every one of us a better return. And third, when we ship our resources by pipeline instead of by rail, the cost to ship goes down and the return to Albertans goes up. Right now, because of our limited pipeline access, we're shipping primarily to the United States on rail, and so we are doing it for much less than your resources are worth. It costs the Canadian economy at least $40 million a day. Even more right now with a differential at absurd, punishing, and record-setting levels. Just yesterday, for heaven's sakes, it was over $50. That differential means that instead of that money going into our economy, it goes into whatever the Americans want to spend it on. Yachts, private jets, border walls, you name it. I ask you, does this make any sense? Does it make any sense for Canada to take a deeply discounted price on an oil produced under an emissions cap because we are forced to move it by rail to one market south of the border? Does it make any sense for Canada to hold our own economy hostage while countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia can sell their oil around the world and also in eastern Canada? to country, uh, countries that I might add don't care one whit about climate change. Of course it doesn't. I submit that it's ridiculous. And I would say to those who oppose our fight to build this pipeline that they are being extremely foolish. Let me break it down. They care about climate change, but they are attacking a continental climate leader, our province. Without there is no hope of Canada meeting its climate commitments. They care about the safeties of our cities and towns, but they are advocating for more oil moving by trains and trucks. They care about marine safety, yet they ignore the historic $1.5 billion investment in marine safety that comes alongside the Trans Mountain Pipeline, an investment that will make it safer for the roughly 100 ships that use those waters every day, not just the one additional oil tanker that would come as a result of Trans Mountain. They care about human rights, as we all do here. But by restricting Alberta from selling its oil on world markets, we're forced to do business with some of the world's most repressive autocratic regimes. 
and pipeline opponents tend to support strong public services. But just how are we supposed to support them in sh a shrinking economy never seems to come up. The bottom line is this. Maybe on Salt Spring Island you can build an economy on condos and coffee shops, but not in Edmonton and not anywhere in Alberta. Here in Alberta, we ride horses, not unicorns. And I invite pipeline opponents to saddle up on something that is real. So, my friends, here in Alberta, we have built one of the world's greatest societies in one of the world's harshest climates by working, by building, and by looking out for one another. As I said at the beginning of my remarks, the public schools you teach in are a testament to that. Today's Alberta is one of the most forward-looking places in the world. At our best, we Albertans don't care who you love, where you worship, or the color of your skin. We care about the content of our character. At our best, we Albertans have built strong public institutions for the public good. We are home to some of the best schools, some of the best universities, and the best hospitals in the world. At our best, we Albertans take our responsibility to future generations seriously. And that's why we are leaders on climate action. And that's why we are leaders in innovation. And that's why we produce energy products to the highest standards in the world. And that's why we are fighting to open up new markets and get fair value for our resources. And at our best, we Albertans put people first. From the gas station attendant who works long hours for the highest minimum wage in the country, to the families and First Nations in Alberta who are finally getting clean, reliable drinking water. To the working mom who benefits from an expanded child benefit. To the injured oil worker who now receives fair compensation. To the student who can afford to go to university because of the tuition freeze. And to the patient who gets world-class care because we have not privatized our health care. To the new immigrant who takes a tough job but has the protection now of fair and careful labor and health and safety laws. I might say that in regards to this, the approaches adopted by pipeline opponents and my opponent in the next election share more in common than they might actually like to admit. From both extremes, they will roll back action on climate and economic progress for working people. In treating the economy and the environment as mutually exclusive, they will fail on both. Inequality will grow, economic opportunity will shrink, and we will have to look our grandkids in the eye and say we didn't act when we had the chance. I refuse to let that future come to pass without a fight. On our watch, Alberta is a climate leader. On our watch, the government stands with working people during the recession and through our recovery. And on our watch, we will keep fighting for a pipeline until the job is done. That's why I've come here today, because I believe in the power of public education to change lives. And I want our kids and their kids and their kids' kids to inherit a better world. That won't happen if we turn our back on climate change, and it won't happen if we turn our back on working people. So thank you very much for listening to me today.